Welcome to Design Domination, where you'll learn to become a better, more business savvy designer so you can dominate your competition. Do you want to gain a competitive edge over other designers and get better results from your branding and design work? If so, check out my new accessible branding and design course. You can get early bird pricing only through December 23rd. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. I'm Colleen Grotzer, and in this episode of Design Domination, I've got special guest Jake Albion. Stick around to hear how Jake pursued his passion of a creative career, despite being told it might not be possible because of his colorblindness, and how he became even more driven by his disability and turned it into a huge advantage. Jacob Albion of Albion.Digital, a web development business based in Fort Myers, Florida, specializes in WordPress websites. He works with both agency and business owners to build profitable, functional, and modern websites that curate an online experience to achieve specific goals. As a colorblind user, Jake applies his own experience and knowledge of web accessibility to improve the usability of each site and bring the most value for each site visitor and website owner. Jake is currently working on a couple of passion projects, most notably a blog called Colorblind by Design, to share his artwork and experiences as a colorblind artist and designer, which will be going live in the coming months. Jake can also be found on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Welcome to the podcast, Jake. It's so great to talk to you today. Yeah, nice to talk to you too. So we had talked a bit in Facebook Messenger a while back about accessibility, and you shared some really interesting things with me. So I really can't wait for other designers to hear about these things too. Yeah, cool. So you had mentioned you have colorblindness. So I wanted to start out and ask you what type of colorblindness you have. So I don't know the official testing of it. Uh, I think it's called like protan. There, there is like a, a special word for it, but I've never been. Like, Protonopia. I think so, but I've never been actually officially tested. It was like uh, to, to see if I wanted to use those sunglasses that everybody was trying out. Um, oh. Yeah, but I know that when I've gone for eye exams, like if there's those 14 little color bubbles, I only usually get like two of them right. So they don't like diagnose your colorblindness. They're just like, oh, yeah, you're a colorblind person. There's not really a whole lot of details to it because, it, you know, it's not really the kind of disability that really affects you in day to day life. So I've never really spent a lot of time researching it in that way, if that makes sense. So Yeah, I know there's a couple types of red green colorblindness, and that's mm-hmm. what it is, right? Red green colorblindness. Yeah, it's also because I come from a family full of colorblind people. So my brother is colorblind, my uncle's colorblind, my mom's colorblind. Actually, my great grandma is also colorblind. So it's and we all had different kinds and levels of colorblindness. Mm. So, um, so I'm kind of aware that some of them are, and I've looked at some of the tests and stuff, but I've never really tried to go through and diagnose anything. One in twelve males can have colorblindness, but it's very rare for women. I mean, that's like one in two hundred. Oh yeah, yeah, and it's uh, usually not like a lot. So like my mom, for example, she's just blue purple colorblind. Like she just has problems with blue and purple, and it's not nearly as bad as any of the guys. So which is why they loved playing games that had color codes with us, <laughs> because even though the women were colorblind too, it was like, oh okay, cool, we can whoop them in this, you know. <laughs> so. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> Yeah. So when did you realize or were you told that you had colorblindness? So all the way back in kindergarten, I, w- I knew how to read and I would cheat quite a bit <laughs> because uh, I grew up pretty artistic. But because I learned how to read the labels on the crayons and stuff like that, I got away with it for a while. And I didn't know that. It's just, you know, learning at home. That's how I learned was from reading the labels. And, you know, being so young, they just, oh, yeah, kids just coloring all this stuff. But then we had to do a project where we had to color a person. And I colored the person with uh, purple skin and green hair because there was no labels on the crayons. Yeah. So they're like, oh, there might be something different going on here. And sure enough, they like tried a few different things with me because they realized that there were no labels on there. So that's just how I remember it. And maybe it was a little bit different. But yeah, that was kind of like the first sign. And I was very artistic growing up, doing lots of like painting and drawing and stuff like that. So um when I got to middle school is more when I learned a lot more how to deal with that colorblindness as an artist. So. Oh, wow. This is not a problem on a daily basis necessarily, but have you faced any obstacles as a result of having colorblindness? It's just more like you get teased every once in a while because you see a car, like if you're playing a game, right? And the car is red, mm-hmm. but I think it's black. Like 
that's pretty much the worst that came of it you know like some harmless teasing it, there's nothing really that's ever it's never put me in say a dangerous situation or put me back in any real significant way so it's just more of an inconvenience than anything else is how i would describe it because everyone always asks me too about like driving cars they're like oh like do you have problems reading the traffic light and it's like no because like you might be reading the colors but i'm reading the positions of the lights but i'm doing that subconsciously it's not like i'm you know, aware of that's how I'm handling something. That's so funny that you mentioned that because I was just going to say, you know, I use that exact example in my, in, in the course that I'm just coming out with, like right now, the accessible branding and design course. Even if you can't tell what color, the red from the yellow from the green, there's that different position to tell you, you know, which one you need to do. Yeah, you especially when you know you have color blindness, you start making assumptions. So um, when I like people would ask, you know, everyone's favorite game when they find out I'm color blind is what's this color? What's this <laughs> color? So like, what color is the grass to you? The grass is green because I know it's green. Like I don't consciously sit there and look. I mean, sometimes I look and I go, wow, that grass is brown, but it might actually be brown. So, mm -hmm. you know, and I know the sky is blue. So that's why it's also really hard uh, when someone's color blind, even when people when people try to take you seriously. So whether I'm doing things for art or whether I'm doing things for design, it's hard for people to conceive the fact that I'm colorblind because you grow up adapting to your situation. And because like I said, it's an inconvenience. It's not actually something that really stops you from doing anything. So maybe this is just the way I grew up. Like I was very fortunate to run into people that taught me how to cope with my disability as an artist. So but when you were growing up, you had mentioned to me when we were talking before, you mm -hmm. had mentioned that you were told you wouldn't be able to do anything creative professionally because of that. Yeah, there was a few things that went on there. Um, you know, like, obviously, all parents are loving and they want you to do well and stuff like that. But at the time, like, they never saw art as really because graphic design wasn't even really that big or something we were aware of. Uh, when I was growing up, like I, I, me nor my parents were in touch with any of that stuff. So it's like, oh, well, you know, it's very hard to grow up and be an artist. And the fact that you're colorblind would make things a lot more difficult for you. So there's, you know, they said they always wanted me to keep it as a passionate thing. But I grew up around a lot of entrepreneurs. So I was always on a business track. So that's kind of the track that I was. Mm. Like I said, it's not that they discouraged me from art in any way. It was just more I was more encouraged towards business because that's what a lot of my family did. So uh, it seems like the most creative in my career I was going to be is like marketing and, and recommending creativity, not as much building. So to be able to find a career where I can actually create things and be creative um, was really awesome to fall into this. So, And what made you not give up on wanting to be a creative professional? I think I just never stopped doing art. So I was always, I always stayed artistically inclined, even if I wasn't doing it as much. And when I first started in marketing, I went through like, I call it like the normal millennial phase. So like I joined an agency and they threw me into SEO and they threw me into social media because back then, you know, you make a post and, you know, you get a bunch of likes and like no one knew how to measure anything. So I like bounced around uh, doing all this different stuff. I actually didn't even, I hated technology actually when I got out of college, like they had to teach me how to use email like seven times because I just didn't think it was important. Um, <laughs> which dead wrong. Um, but yeah, so over time, I like started playing with graphic design stuff. And I used to hang out with all the different people in the agency. So I was hanging out with the graphic designers, I was hanging out with like the video guy. And I got to work with all of them because I was very, you know, I was someone that wanted to try everything. So all of a sudden, I'm figuring out that like, oh, I, I can handle this stuff. And in college, even I took a, a web design class that I did not do well in. Um, oh, because of the color issue or because of something else? No, oh. <laughs> no. The way they taught was old school. We didn't use divs. We used tables. Oh, dear. And my exams, like all my tests were handwritten, handwriting code. So like there was no direct feedback. So if you did something wrong, there was no way to correct it because you were writing it all down. Um, and I was also a senior in college who really did not care that much about how the class was going. Um, so it's just and like I said, I wasn't very technologically inclined. So I had friends who were computer science majors, and I did not like math, and they were in all that stuff. And I remember seeing someone use inspector tools, and it blowing my mind, you know, like, oh, my God, like, look at him, he's changing the website. <laughs> so something clicked when I joined an agency, and all of a sudden figuring out like, oh, the colors are not just something that I have to do visually, like, there's hex codes, and there's RGB, and there's these shortcuts I can take. 
Because, like, I'm the kind of guy who grew up with, like, my mom labeling my paints. Like, it's embarrassing, but that's what happened. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, like, I learned the color wheel. So, like, even though I can't see it, I understood color theory, color relationships, all this stuff. Oh, wow. Yeah. And because like, people love seeing my paintings because, you know, it's like, okay, paint this photo. And then I paint it and it was different because I'm colorblind and they thought it was fascinating. So all of a sudden, someone's handing me these keys to the kingdom, so to speak, when it comes to the website, because <laughs> all of a sudden, my disability is no longer a disability because I have the knowledge and I have the tools to be able to create this stuff. So just not that everything I create is not going to be as good as someone who doesn't have color blindness, because you can't use color theory and hex codes to create a good color pattern, right? Like it's still subjective at the end of the day, mm-hmm. but I can get really, really close. And I've also like, I'm not gonna lie, I've gotten frustrated to the point where I was trying to create color palettes and like literally like on the verge of tears, so frustrated that I could not Mm. get it to be just right. But it's also got me to the point where I was, I I was accepting that like, okay, this is just a weakness that I have and I can do it to a certain point, but then this is where I also need to start asking for help. And it doesn't mean I just have to ask other designers like I have people I can go to whether they're designers or not and ask them their opinions you know and I can make judgment calls based on that so I started to create a support network I found all these resources all these other things that all of a sudden turn my disability into what I think is more of an advantage um, because like a normal designer might only be relying on like their subjective view of these colors where like I have to rely on color psychology and color theory and You know, I have to get other people's opinions. So it's a much more involved process, which is why I don't do it very much. But when I do do it, I can still pull it off. That is really interesting. Yeah. Well, did you ever like have a backup plan? Like, hey, what if this creative professional stuff doesn't work out? I would say that I was lucky professionally to the way I've always handled things is to move in a direction of something I like until I wasn't having fun anymore. And then I would just pick a different direction. And it's Not like I completely went into a completely different direction, but like, for example, I hated SEO. You know, I did it for a couple of weeks, didn't like it, moved on to social media. And social media was fun because I got to do some graphic design, but I didn't really love doing social media and ads and stuff. So I moved on to videography. So um, that's kind of been the nice thing is, is I never really, my backup plan was more of just kind of keep moving around. And if I found something I liked, I'd kind of research it and figure out like, hey, is this something I can do? What would it take to do it? And so like I tried all these different things. And the reason why I picked web design is I had been traveling abroad as a digital nomad. I was like a senior content strategist and strategic. I don't know. I had all these fancy titles for the agency I worked with Um, because I was like the jack of all trades kind of guy. The jake of all trades. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. And I thought that's really what I loved because I was very high level strategy, understanding how the brand works as a whole ecosystem. But then I started to hang out with a friend who did web design. And the thing I noticed is like, well, since I loved traveling, I love learning new languages. Like I've lived in a couple of countries for a month at a time and I'd like pick up the language, learn how to order my food. Oh, nice. I have have a foreign language degree. (laughs) Oh, perfect. Yeah. I grew up learning Hebrew, Latin, ancient Greek. Uh, I got to live in Greece, which was pretty cool. But I learned conversational Greek living there for three months while abroad for school. I lived in Croatia for a month. I picked up Croatian. Yeah, which was hilarious because the Croatians were confused why anyone would learn Croatian if they're not Croatian. I know somebody from there, actually. (laughs) Okay, yeah. And it's an awesome language to learn. And that's just what I like is like traveling to a place, kind of getting really involved in the culture. And how that carried over into web design is all of a sudden it's like, oh, I get to learn these languages and I get to build something. And this is also like the foundation of an online presence, right? So understanding the ecosystem the way I explain to people now is like when I'm building a website I'm building a store or a building you know and I have friends that do PPC that I work with people that do social and what I describe to customers is like so that's like building the roads back to your store so once your store is built and everything is set up to make sure that we can convert people to customers um, it's about driving that traffic so I realized that the language aspect and being able to create something and be creative and it allowed me to still be involved in all these things I learned, but it brought me back to that central point of the website and the website allowed me to do what I love most, which is learning new languages and being creative and allowed me to really design. So even though I'm not a full on graphic designer, you know, but I I have done like logos and color palettes and stuff, 
I get to focus on the parts that I'm really, really good at, but I still get to flirt with all these other things that I enjoy doing. That's so cool. I love that. Yeah. How does colorblindness impact how you choose color for projects? So I think the easiest way to address this, and this is more just, I learned how to explain this easier from learning about accessibility. I, I don't really think about colorblindness at all. And it's not that I don't think about it. It's that I'm focusing more on things like contrast and mm -hmm. like keeping things visible. Because the hard thing for people to understand about colorblindness is it's not a disadvantage for me as the user. It's a disadvantage for you and your customer. And the reason why is because if you don't have the right contrast and things aren't designed in a way for a low vision user, which would be someone with colorblindness, maybe they don't see so well they're going to miss the really important things you want them to do, like say a call to action. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So I don't think about colorblindness really. It's just more about creating visibility and having, I know the term is universal design. So making sure that it's universally visible for anyone that can see your website. And that's kind of how I characterize it. So it, I do think about colorblindness to an extent, but I think that if you hit the right amount of contrast and if you rely on color theory, like using complementary colors and things like that, you don't have to worry about that nearly as much. Uh, in fact, I don't think about it at all. I don't, because if there's a high level of contrast and I don't have to worry about colors getting confusing, like even if you're blue, yellow colorblind. Right. As a designer with colorblindness, how do you make design better for others with colorblindness? And I guess this is why I'd hit on the accessibility again, like taking a course like yours is, is helping people understand like the way I would understand when you're thinking about low vision, colorblindness, and all these other things is I like to explain it like most people have been to Disney World, right? Or Disneyland. And it reminds me of the Bugs Life, right? Whatever, the thing in the tree. There's like a 4D theater where, you know, you can watch it and you can hear it, but it's also like spraying water at you and smoke. Oh. Yeah. So that's how I think about websites is like if I'm thinking about it from a screen reader perspective, it's a different type of experience that the website is offering than if I'm a visual user. Mm -hmm. And if I'm a visual user, what are the different types of experiences that are people are having? So I can't control their experience, but I can control getting the right kind of content and the right kind of message in front of them and making sure that it's cohesive and it's giving people the information they need. So that's how I would encourage people to think about it is rather than just, yes, you should think about each type of disability as it applies to your site, but it's really more about what do all these disabilities have in common and how can I make a design that will get them to do what my client needs them to do on the site. Exactly. Has having colorblindness made you design differently? But I guess not because you've always designed this way. You've learned what you need to do. But, but really, not just the how you do it, though, what you take into consideration, like you're talking about contrast. Yeah, so there was a, like a wake-up call for me, too, for accessibility. So I had a teacher whose ex-husband was a colorblind artist, and so she actually taught me how to be creative with colorblindness by reading shades and being able to ballpark colors, and she's the one that encouraged me to learn color theory and all that different kind of stuff. So. I kind of came in with a lot of these tools that I don't know that everyone else came in with, or, you know, I feel like my perspective might've been a little bit different, mm -hmm. but learning about accessibility, it allowed me to kind of really access a lot more resources that would do that. Because when I first started within six months of being an actual full on web developer, I went to WordCamp US in Nashville. It was the first one. And I saw... Uh, I'm sorry if I put your name, Re uh, Rianne Reitveld. Oh, Rianne Reitveld. Yeah, yeah, I saw her talk. On, She's great. <laughs> yeah, that was my first introduction to accessibility. It was like literally the first, you know, the first talk at my first WordCamp, my first introduction, everything. And to be honest, like everyone around me, especially I was there with a friend, like they completely didn't even care about accessibility. But to me, I was like, I'm colorblind. Like this has to do with me and finding out over time that it was a bigger and bigger problem. So I, I guess I did always kind of have it in mind, but when I learned that there, I don't want to say there was a market for it because I didn't do it because there was a market. I did it because I wanted to, as a service provider, you want to do everything you can to give your client all their advantages and make sure that they're going to be able to make money. Like at the end of the day, if they're not making money with you, then they're not going to stick with you. So 
my mindset was, wow, I can actually create an experience where more people, like people who may be frustrated on other websites come to this website and then they, they want to work with my client. So I'm, I'm basically allowing them to get more people. Exactly. <laughs> so like, I felt like I had the right motivation of, of doing that. So that's, that's really kind of what brought me into all this was, you know, it was never about like, oh, well, I'm going to do this so they don't get sued. It's like, no, I'm going to create the best experience possible. So as many people that come here don't just love the experience of the site, they want to work with my client and they want to they want to work with me longer because of that. Yeah. And I mean, I've seen research that says 71 percent of users with a disability that go to a site that isn't accessible, they will leave. Yep, That's a lot of people. And then they're going to tell other people, hey, you know, they're not inclusive. They're not making their site accessible to, you know, up to 20 percent of the population. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and for people that don't understand what it's like to go on a site and to get frustrated like that, like imagine trying to go to a website and having to wait 20 seconds for it to load. (laughs) Like you're sitting there and like, I want to work with you. I'm literally doing everything I can. Like as a colorblind person who, if your site was like, let's say it was really inaccessible from a colorblind standpoint and I can't see any of your call to actions. Like that's frustrating for me. Like I want to work with you. I'm looking for a reason to work with you Mm -hmm. and you're making it difficult because maybe you wanted to be really artsy or you thought it looked really cool. Like, that's all great. But at the end of the day, like, I can't do what I need to do to work with you. So I'm going to go work someplace. I'm going to go find it someplace else because I'm frustrated now. So even if I tried to work with you, I'm already upset. You're creating barriers. Yeah, exactly. And design needs to be functional in order to be successful. Yeah, exactly. That's why I, I love how the industry is really driven by creating pretty things. But the harsh reality I had to learn a very long time because when I first started doing web design too you know I wanted to build really cool websites and now working with a lot of small businesses they can care less not only do they not want to pay for it they just want something that works and that's going to convert so that's why like yeah can I make your whole site parallax sure but if it's giving half the users a headache maybe parallax isn't a great idea right (laughs) luckily I learned that lesson early on where I, I know it's it's difficult because everyone wants to build something really cool not just for your portfolio like even just for your ego but sometimes we have to build things that are a little bit less pretty but a lot more functional exactly totally agree with that well so when you're working on a project like let's say you're working on a brand identity design right or you're working on you know a web design How do you go about choosing colors? Like, do you say, okay, I'm going to go to a swatch book or do you start with like, okay, I know the colors I want to use for this are going to be, you know, green and orange. What is your process for figuring out which colors you're going to use and then how you're actually selecting those colors, like the values? Yeah, I I don't know everyone else's process quite as much, but I, I am familiar just with the regular graphic design and web design process of like asking a client what kind of colors they like and dislike is where I start. And then from there, I do think more from a color psychology. So to be honest, I am a big fan of blue and orange, and it has nothing to do with UF, I promise. (laughs) But I'm a big fan of blue and orange because, you know, blue is about trust. And, you know, just from a psychological standpoint, orange is very friendly. So right, that's exactly how I start picking colors is I stick with more generic color palettes. Like teal is a little bit uh, more unusual for me. But if a client requests teal, I'll go in and I'll find color combinations for teal through the coolers generator. And I'll play around with some different colors to see what I can come up with. And if I'm like working on the branding, I do two to three colors for the logo. So I try to make sure they're always complementary if I can. It's just my default. I feel a lot more comfortable with complementary colors than say any of the other, you know, like analogous or triads. Like I don't feel as comfortable with those. And like I said, I do check in with people. So once I have more of those generic colors picked, then I try to compare it to kind of what's out there with the competition or if there's a brand I thought that did it really, really well. So now I'm moving out of my comfort zone where even though I understand the colors, now we're moving more into the subjective side. I try the best I can to create those subjective colors with, you know, messing with the hue and the saturation and stuff like that. And once I have that done, and sometimes it's just finding an image where I just really like the color palette and just pulling that out. And then like, like on Adobe's thing, I'll like just start switching through like, oh, do I want it to be deep colors? Do I want it to be lighter? So I just start playing with all these different color palettes and kind of mixing and matching. And once I have like two solid brand colors, I create two or three accent colors. And then I always design my logos in black and white first. Oh, good. I love that. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I learned that in a graphic design class. They told me, because uh, I actually went back to, when I came back home from school, I actually went and took some classes at the local college for graphic design because I just wanted to learn more. I was just interested. And they said always, 
design your logos in black and white and imagine that it's two inches by two inches and has to be printed a thousand times on hundreds of tote bags will your logo not look good (laughs) you know is it going to be clear or if a big truck was driving by and you could only see it for two seconds could you make out what the logo was and inherently know what that is so those are kind of the different things that I think about. So if I, you know, if colors kind of seem conflicting to me, then I definitely won't use them. But then I also know that I do have to ask for help. If I'm working with people on the project, I'll ask them. I'll send it to some close friends or family that I know kind of have some kind of artsy taste. Um, <laughs> and yeah, from there, then I just get clients approval. So sometimes clients want to tweak stuff. And to be honest, there is times where I don't agree with the direction that the clients go with. And I just... Of course. <laughs> yeah. And I let them know like, hey, this is why it doesn't work. But the nice thing is when I'm explaining it, I don't say, oh, that doesn't look good. I say, oh, you know, from a color psychology standpoint or from, you know, the way the the color wheel works, like I would not advise this because you're only looking at just the logo, but I'm thinking about what the logo looks like on the website, on a hat, on a tote bag. Right. I'm thinking about it in all these different things. And I think that's where that advantage comes in is being able to explain that and how I came to those colors. Right. And, you know, having those reasons, they trust me even when they know I'm colorblind. They still trust me because they're like, oh, this, you know, these things make sense and other people think it makes sense. Like the colors make sense subjectively. I was going to ask you, you know, do you tell clients about your color blindness? Because I was thinking, you know, how is that going to affect you defending your color choices? But it doesn't sound like that's an issue. No, I, I was really nervous at first. And uh, so, I mean, my business has a couple of different kinds of clients. So I have like white label clients, and then I freelance with a couple of people, and then I have my own clients. And what was really cool with a company I work very closely with doing white label, the guy I worked with actually encouraged me to bring that up a lot more. Mm. We started bringing it up in meetings because accessibility was a topic that we had to address. Mm -hmm. And it actually validated it more because it's like, no, we have a colorblind person who not only built your website, but like if I did the logos and colors, they're like, it's as a web developer, I think it's not just obviously web developers that overlook it. But like I've worked with designers that like just don't care about accessibility and I get why they want to build really pretty stuff. Right. I'm trying to change that. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. That's why like, I think your course is great and everything too, because, you know, you start to think about the fact that like, what you might have learned in school isn't really canon anymore. You know, like, it's definitely helped to have those tools. But in the, you know, designers that I've worked with have started to realize like, oh, okay, like, I do have to understand and justify how this is going to work in all these different ways. Because even though I made a really cool logo with these colors, when I get it on the website, all of a sudden, now I have a conflicting color palette, because I have to make it accessible. And I can't change your branding, Mm -hmm. you know? Right, exactly. I run into this issue all the time, too. Yeah. Yeah. So and then obviously, it puts us in a weird spot, especially when like, how do you defend as a web developer? Like I want to defend the graphic designer I'm working with. Right. I can only do so much for you if you didn't take accessibility into account. But I am because now you have to explain to the client why the palette doesn't work in digital. You know, right. I run into that all the time, remediating other creative firms in design files. And when making suggestions like in a website audit, you know, here's what you could change it to, but I need to know what your brand color palette looks like so I can kind of give you a good idea of what to change this to without totally mucking up how it's going to look, you know, based on that existing color palette. Because you want to, as a designer, I want to maintain that brand integrity. But at the same time, it's like, what are we working with here? You know? Exactly. Yeah. I feel like in the designer world, it would be like if you only designed in CMYK and then all of a sudden you had to go build something in RGB and like the CMYK stuff just doesn't really at least for me, convert over, right? So like, I've actually had that happen where someone designed something in CMYK and then they're upset because it doesn't match up when I go and build the website. And I was like, Mm -hmm. well, that's because these things are not the same. Right. You know, so I think that'd be a good way for designers to think about it is like, you know, the same way you want CMYK and RGB to be able to work together and still have that cohesive look. That's the same thing that your web developer partner is looking for if you're a graphic designer or web designer working with a developer like we all want the same thing we want that cohesiveness and that's where both sides need to take responsibility like because I kind of had that fluid role sure I've learned like okay I have to be responsible for these things but I also have to hold my partner accountable for these things too for this to work so yeah it's definitely everybody's responsibility what tools do you use in your work process like what apps or checkers or things like that do you usually use 
Um, so if I'm picking out a color system, um, I like to play with material design because I can play with the shades a little bit more and it kind of has, it, you know, there's a algorithm that sets that. Is that a program? No, it's the uh, material design system. So I basically do makeshift design systems. I'm trying to get, I promise I'm trying to get a lot better and actually create my own design systems. <laughs> but, you know, so I take inspiration from like the material design, which I think is Google. So I use their color tool. I use coolers, which is like a color generator. I use Adobe Colors, mostly to pull colors from pictures. And it's nice because I can export them into, I use Illustrator and Photoshop all the time. Uh, so that's for kind of picking out my colors. And then when it comes to checking for accessibility on the website, I mean, obviously you do need to have the manual knowledge to really do a good job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for the generators, I use Axe from DeQ. I use Wave. I use Lighthouse. Special warning too, like there are false positives on some of those things. Oh, yeah. Which is why it's super important to understand manual. Yeah. And what are you using for contrast checking? So it's contrast-ratio.com. I do rely on Wave a little bit for that. So even though it flags a contrast error, sometimes it's just not a contrast error or it's because you're on the back end and, you know, like the little WordPress back, the dashboard bar pops up, that, that'll flag it. Oh, yeah, right? That's so annoying. And I have to go log out of the site and then redo the check, right? That's so annoying. Yep. And I do use a couple different plugins. Uh, there's one in particular, right? but it's from St. Pete Design, who I also saw speak. I use their plugin sometimes. And this is all, once again, this is not stuff that I 100% rely on. So right. these are just things to help me find trends. Like the same way you use GT Metrics or Lighthouse or anything. Like I don't go, oh, well, this is definitely something wrong with the site. I'm looking for those trends that you know, of errors. And then I go and I solve the errors that way. Yeah. And I wanted to just reiterate the point, what you were saying about the automated checkers like Wave and Axe, because I mean, several times a week I get tagged in accessibility posts on Facebook because everybody identifies me with it. <laughs> and there's always somebody there who's saying, just run Wave, just run Axe, just do this, yeah. just install this overlay. And I'm like, no. Yeah. No, there are false positives. They don't pick up 70% of issues, 70 to 75% of issues. I mean, if you're only checking with those checkers, you're missing out on the bulk of the... And you could be making it worse. Yeah. I mean, so you, if you don't know about accessibility and you're just running these checkers and relying on them, I mean, you're really missing the boat because there's so many things they're not catching. I mean, they're only catching 25% of issues. And mm -hmm. like you said, they give false positives and you have to know, you have to be able to, to determine whether that's a false positive or not. Yeah, definitely. There's so many major things that they can't even detect. And then, you know, then some plugins, like they'll help you find images that don't have alt text. Well, yep. maybe there's an image that has alt text that shouldn't. Maybe there's an image that has alt text that doesn't have good alt text. So, Or the builder. The builder might actually have the alt text inserted, but like, and if you were to test it manually, it reads fine. But according to the checker, it's not there. So now you're sitting there spending hours trying to fix something that's not a problem. I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> so you kind of touched on this already, but... What do you wish more designers knew about accessibility? Is there anything else you want to add to that? I guess just know that there is a lot of free resources out there to get started. And I would still encourage people because I'm, I'm actually taking a class and I do always encourage people to take classes if you really want to make sure you're doing it right. But yeah, take advantage of the re free resources that are out there, like the A11Y project. And, you know, I know uh, you did a talk for WP Accessibility Day and there's mm -hmm. countless talks from uh, WordPress TV. Like, that's how I started. When I first started, it wasn't like I was just like, okay, I know all this accessibility stuff. I'm just going to insert it. Right. No, I started out with like an 11 step checklist from the St. Pete Design Talk. And I just started building up on that list over time. It actually made me. So did I. So it made me more valuable at the agent. So if you work for an agency, it makes you more valuable to the agency you work for. Absolutely. Especially because honestly, the guys I worked for couldn't care less. But I just did it because I wanted things to be better. You eventually build to the part where like you have an entire process now. Mine's nine pages long. <laughs> yeah. Oh wow. That's my checklist. Nine pages. <laughs> I'm I'm actually rewriting mine right now. So and it's not just a checklist either. It's literally explaining even design tips. You know, like so when you're designing something this way, like it's not just like make sure this level of contrast, but make sure maybe it's designed a specific way that will help someone with that's low vision who might have cataracts, for example. You know, and I'm just thinking through all those different experiences. So that's 
that's what I would encourage people to do is don't be intimidated because there's there's so many resources out there. If you just take the time even a little bit every day yeah. to go and read these resources, it doesn't just help you and it doesn't just help your customer. You're creating a better environment for all of the users on the internet. You know, there's there's enough internet pollution out there. Yeah, there's a lot of bad info about accessibility out there too. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, that's why even with the overlays, Ugh. you might think it's a good temporary Band-Aid, but because I did just work with a big client who wanted me to do it, and they literally asked me to. They're like, so you're saying that if I do everything you tell me, I'm not going to get sued. <laughs> and my response was, absolutely not. I can definitely not tell you that. And I said, if you hear anyone telling you that, run away because they're lying to you. Right, exactly. Accessibility is an ongoing thing. It's just adding steps and constantly improving and creating. Yeah. There are so many websites out there where people are t making no effort. Right. And those are also who the lawyers and stuff are after. Exactly. So even if you put in... Yeah. So if you put in a little bit of effort, even just making sure you have the alt tags and making sure that there's no keyboard traps, even doing some of those things will make you less of a target. And your clients need to understand that too. Right. I also stay away from talking about lawsuits with people. For me, it's definitely about like, oh, we want to have as many people coming to your site and having a good experience as possible. In my opinion, that's the right way to approach it. Right. Definitely don't ever tell someone that they won't get sued if they have an accessible website because it's, it's a myth. Right. Anybody can sue anybody for anything at any time. So nobody, even lawyers, can't say you won't get sued. But if your site's accessible, then you're a less of a target, like you said. Exactly. And if anything, too, people are going to give you more feedback to make your sites better. Right. And that's going to make you better in the market. It's going to make you a, a better developer that people come to, you know, because for me, I actually don't even really bring up accessibility that much. I tell people it's just a default feature in my websites. Like if they ask me, it's like, oh, yeah, we, we just work on that stuff naturally. But that way, too, you know, I want it to be a comfortable conversation. I don't want to scare anyone or anything like that. Like, I want them to be doing it for the right reasons because they want to give people a better experience. They want to grow their business. You know, I don't want to be there like, hey, you got to do this so you don't get sued. Right. Well, this has been I have really enjoyed this chat. This has been a lot of fun. I always love talking about this. And it's nice to have somebody else on to talk about this. Yeah, me too. So where can listeners find you online? My site is albion.digital. It's under construction for right now, but I'll make sure it comes back up pretty soon. Um, so that's my main website right now. And then you can find me on, uh, I have a Facebook page for albion.digital, Instagram, and Twitter. Actually, I thought one cool thing from the group that, that motivated me, and I, I don't think I told you about this yet. I was inspired because a couple of people asked me about my art. So for a side blog, I decided to create a site called Colorblind by Design. Oh. Yeah. It's going to be a uh, place for me to kind of share a lot of my art and stuff as I'm getting, you know, I'm trying to get back into that as a hobby and just like as a place to kind of share my experience and that way people can see it a little bit more. And, you know, to your point, just make a little bit more awareness, not just about accessibility, but just you know, it's always cool to see art from a different perspective. And that's really what I decided to start doing for the blog. Because a few people had asked to, about some of my old artwork. And I was like, okay, well, if I'm going to start doing it again, I might as well get a blog going. And that was inspired by my group. I love that. Oh, my gosh. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So, And that'll be up probably in the, I'm not going to lie, it'll probably be about six months before it's up. But that will be up eventually. So, uh, yeah. I, this has really been fun. I can't tell you how much I enjoyed this. <laughs> Same. This is awesome. Accessibility has been a game changer for my business. If you want to learn more about accessibility and how you can get a competitive edge over other designers and get better results from your work, get my free guide on understanding and selling accessible websites. And check out my Foundations of Website Accessibility course and my Accessible Branding and Design course. Go to creative-boost.com freebies and also click on Courses.